Hello there. Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I am using this color palette, the turquoise, the reds, the earth tone colors in the background, and I'm going to use this color palette to color this digital stamp. This is from the Lee Holland Etsy store, and I will link that down below, as well as all of the colors that I use to recreate this color combination. Um, the color choices that I used, there are a couple of times where there is quite a large gap between colors, so you will see me doing a lot of tip to tip, where I'm taking the brush tip to the chisel tip of a, dar a darker marker to kind of bridge that gap. Once I am finished coloring, I'm going to add a little bit of interest to the background by taking the very lightest um, blue-green that I'm using and add the idea of clouds into the background of the um, card panel, the image, and then I'm going to use it to create a card. So that's all the coloring. So let's get on to our crime. Our alphabetical journey today takes us to the state of Virginia. One of the original 13 colonies, Virginia was first part of the country permanently settled by the English. The English established Jamestown on the banks of the James River in 1607. The disappearance of the residents of Jamestown is still a mystery. Virginia was a major player in calling the colonies to war in what would become the Revolutionary War. Revolts against British British taxation, including the 1765 Stamp Act, culminated with Patrick Henry delivering his famous Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech before the Second Virginia Convention at St. John's Church in Richmond on March 23, 1775. The speech called for Virginia to raise a militia in defense against the British, and in April of that year, the Revolutionary War began. Thomas Jefferson, a Virginia delegate to the Second Continental Congress, wrote the Declaration of Independence, which was ratified by the 13 colonies on July 4, 1776. In that same year, Virginia became a commonwealth with its own constitution and government. Another Virginia native and delegate to the Continental Congress, George Washington, was named Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. The American Revolution came to an end in Virginia on October 19, 1781, following three weeks of continuous bombardment, the British General Lord Charles Cornwallis surrendered to George General, General George Washington, there we go, in the Battle of Yorktown. Virginia then attained statehood on June 25, 1788, becoming the 10th state to join the United States. The Virginia General Assembly is the oldest continuous lawmaking body in the New World. Earthquakes happen in Virginia, and they are rarely devastating because of their weak magnitude. However, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake in Virginia in 2011 was felt by almost one-third of the population of the United States. I lived here. It was weird, and it was terrifying. The earthquake also shook some neighboring Canadian providences. The effect of the quake was so prominent that it cracked the Washington Monument. It was weird. Shenandoah National Park in Virginia has more than 500 miles of hiking trails. The Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia is the world's largest office building. Tennis legend Arthur Ashe was born in Richmond, Virginia. There is a giant asteroid crater under the Chesapeake Bay, which holds the same amount of water as 50 billion bathtubs. That's how big the Chesapeake Bay is. More than 400,000 people are buried at Arlington Nat National Cemetery. Mother of States is another of Virginia's nicknames. Virginia-born Zachary Taylor was the second president to die while sitting in office. Virginia is the birthplace of more presidents than any other state. The official symbol of Norfolk is a mermaid, and it is Norfolk, not Norfolk, or Norfolk, it's Norfolk. 
Virginia law specifies that Smithfield hams must be made in the town of Smithfield. There are 11 state recognized Native American tribes in Virginia. Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains have the best fall color change in the region. Hands down, gorgeous, beautiful. Virginia has 132 miles of coastline on the Atlantic Ocean. The Virginia State Fair was first held before the Civil War. Chapstick originated in Lynchburg, Virginia. The College of William and Mary is the oldest Virginia university in Virginia. And in the 1800s, in Virginia, one case of kissing cousins, kissing cousins led to murder. Franny Lillian Madison, Lillian as she was known, was born on the 27th of June, 1863 in Virginia to Charles James Madison and Lucy Temple Walker. She was the oldest of their six children, six girls, and sorry, the oldest of their 10 children, six girls and four boys. And Lillian was born while her father was fighting in the Confederate Army. The family owned a small farm, but they were too poor to send Lillian to public school. Lillian grew up on her family farm, but they struggled, Charles and Lucy struggled, to put food on the table. Lillian dreamed of following her friends to boarding school, but her family couldn't afford to send her away. And this kind of drove a wedge between Lillian and her parents. And it kind of added to some contention that was already existing between Charles and his wife's family. <clears throat> Apparently, Lucy had some family members that were wealthier than her and Charles were. In an effort to help Lillian, who did not want to live with her parents anymore, her great aunt Jane Tunstall invited her to stay in her home in Little Plymouth, where she could attend a public school. Aunt Jane offered to cover the tuition for Lillian to attend Dr. Garlick Burlington Academy. Sorry, Dr. Garlick's Burlington Academy. Um, Lillian's parents were not particularly um, comfortable with taking the money, but in the end, they, they agreed and, sh and accepted the gift. And while attending school, Lillian lived with her Aunt Jane. Jane... Um, offered to pay a second year of tuition, but Lillian's parents refused, and that deepened the rift that was already growing between Charles and Lucy and Lucy's extended family. Um, in fact, Charles and Lucy forbade any contact between Lillian and the Turnstall family, and they burned any correspondence that was received, um, that Lillian received from them. Thomas Judson Clervis was born on August 10th in 1861 in Virginia to his parents, Beverly Whitting Clervis and his, and, um, his mom, Mary Agnes Walker. Thomas was the youngest of three boys born to Beverly and Mary Agnes. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, I've heard the name Walker already today. You are correct. Lillian's mother, Lucy, and Thomas's mother, Mary, Mary Agnes, were cousins. Now, Thomas's background was similar to his cousin Lillian, or his second cousin Lillian. He grew up on a small farm, but with only three siblings, his family was, um, their life was not quite as hard. And his parents were less reluctant than Lily's parents had been to accept help from Jane, Jane Tunstall. So Thomas and his older brother, William, went to live with Aunt Jane, and she financed their education. In September of 1880, Thomas began attending Richmond College, which is now the University of Richmond, and in 1882, graduated with a Bachelor of Law degree. After his graduation, Thomas returned to King and Queen County, where he was well-known and highly regarded. He began a successful law practice, he was assistant superintendent of Sunday school at the Olivet Baptist Church. He was known as a man of temperate habits, and he became engaged to a woman named Nolly Bray. 
Lillian, on the other hand, turned 21 and left home for good. By the time she was 21, she was considered um, old enough to be on her own. And for a while, she lived at the home of an uncle named John Walker. And then she moved to Bath, Virginia and worked as a teacher and a governess. Charles, or Charlie Madsen, um, Lillian's dad, was completely against the move. He actually wrote a letter to John Walker and he blamed his wife's family for ruining their daughter. Quote, Several years ago, some people who ought to have been myself and Lucy's best friends became our bitter enemies. They took our oldest child for a tool and carried out their hell-blushing schemes. And from that day to this, our oldest child banded with them. They have done all the human brain could devise to accomplish our ruin. And what has been the result? Um, apparently, Lillian's father thought her some kind of a um, ungrateful or a wanton woman for wanting to be educated and for wanting to teach as well. Now, Lillian and Thomas weren't strangers. They were second cousins. And, and as children, they didn't know each other well. But several times in July and August of 1884, Thomas had actually stayed the night at Thomas Walker's home, the same Uncle Walker where Lillian was living. Um, at the Walker's home, Thomas and Lillian seemed to get along famously. In fact, the quote was, they seemed right smartly attached to each other. And on January 5th of 1885, Lillian and Thomas both spent the night at a hotel in Richmond. And the hotel maid remembered that Lillian did not sleep in her own bed. I know, you're shocked and mortified and completely surprised. Um, a side note here, an important side note, is that in Richmond, there was a reservoir called the Old Marshall Reservoir, constructed in the early 1880s. It no longer exists. However, in 1885, the reservoir was situated on six acres near the James River. And this area consisted of a brick-lined facility that housed water along with the reservoir keeper's house and a small garden behind the street and a path that led to the top walls surrounding the gardens. Near the reservoir was a graveyard and around or separating the graveyard and the reservoir was a fence that was known to have holes big enough that the students of Richmond College could climb through them when they wanted to go swimming in the reservoir. On the morning of March 14, 1885, Lysander Rose, the caretaker of the Old Marshall Reservoir in Richmond, went about his normal duties. But on this morning, well, it was not a typical morning. As he walked toward the reservoir, Lysander found what appeared to be a piece of broken shoestring, a woman's red glove, and what he described as signs of a desperate struggle. And when he peered over into the water, he saw, quote, floating near the top, the flounce or something of a woman's dress and one leg jutting Naturally, the coroner was called, and after he arrived, the muddy body of a young woman was lifted from the water. An initial examination revealed that she had slight bruising on her face, a swollen mouth, and a rip in her gown at the elbow. The dead young woman had not been in the water long, and there had been no decomposition. Later, after further examination, it would be discovered that she was also about eight months pregnant. The body was placed in the almshouse chapel and thousands of people, thousands of people passed by trying to identify the girl. Two times during the two days that she laid in the chapel, someone identified the body as a missing relative. But in each case, the supposed victim was found alive and well. Then on March 17th, a young Richmond woman identified the body as that of her cousin, Fanny Lillian Madison. And this time, the identification proved to be true. 
Initially, the death of Lillian was thought to be a suicide, especially after the death of her pregnancy, because being unmarried and pregnant in Virginia in the 1880s was, well, probably more common than people admitted, but it was not optimal. She was going to have a really hard time supporting herself and this child. The coroner's inquest lasted weeks, and during that inquest, the cause of death was changed from suicide and declared to be a murder. And Thomas Cluberus was charged. Now, although they were cousins, Lillian Thomas seemed to have very little in common. Lillian had a complicated past. She was estranged from her parents and her reputation wasn't um, spotless. Thomas, however, was like the poster child of middle-class normalcy. He was white, well-educated, well-regarded in his community. All the things, right? Um, in about October of 1884, Lillian would have learned she was pregnant, and that is when she moved to Bath County and served as a teacher and a governess. Um, prior to his arrest, Thomas was considered an upstanding citizen. But once the trial began, it was unclear if he was innocent victim or a nefarious seducer and murderer. Now, the indictment against Thomas was based entirely on circumstantial evidence. I mean, because let's face it, this is pre-forensics time frame, right? Any evidence that would have been on her body would have been washed away when she was tossed into the reservoir or pushed or whatever. In the period between the murder and the beginning of the trial, the city of Richmond became bitterly divided between those who believed he was guilty of murder and those who believed that Lillian had committed suicide. And finding a jury of 12 men who did not already have their mind made up was a major hurdle. The evidence in the case included a key watch found near a hole in the fence between the graveyard and the reservoir. And it was soon discovered that Thomas had also been in Richmond on the 13th of March of 1885, the day before Lillian was found. The case against him began to get stronger when a young Richmond boy found a key watch caught on the fence leading to the reservoir, right? So you see, um, Thomas had been seen wearing or had been arrested wearing his watch and chain, but there was no key on the chain. And in fact, just before his arrest, he was seen purchasing a new watch key at a jewelry store. The trial started on the 5th of May and it would go about a month until June 4th of 1885. The two of the most damning eyewitnesses to Thomas's case were given by members of the community, a prostitute and an African-American night watchman. The first was a woman named Mary Curtis. Mary testified that Thomas had visited her at, uh, here's my air quotes that you can't see, House of Bad Repute, where Mary admitted she was working as a prostitute and claimed to have seen Thomas and Lillian together in a bedroom located in the back of a Richmond cigar store. And Mary was easily able to identify Thomas by sight, but she could only describe Lillian as being heavily veiled, wearing a dark colored dress. The only distinguishing feature that Mary said the woman had was her red shawl. This was an article of clothing that was used by several witnesses to prove that it was indeed Lillian with Thomas and not another woman. It seems that Lillian was known for having a red shawl. One of the most detailed accounts of the couple's activities though comes from William Tyler, the night watchman at the Exchange Hotel. According to Tyler, Thomas visited the Exchange Hotel and asked to see the woman staying in room 19. The woman in room 19 was Lillian, who had checked in under the name 
Fanny Merton. The night watchman told Thomas that the lady was not in, and Thomas asked that he pass along a note to her. And the note read, quote, I will be there as soon as possible, so do wait for me. Lillian never got the note. It was torn up and thrown away, and then later found and reassembled by the hotel employees um, and entered into evidence. So they discarded the note until they realized that Lillian was dead and Thomas was the accused. Now, Thomas's relatives paid for the best attorneys available in Virginia, and they focused on their client's character and on the likelihood that Lillian had committed suicide. Um, there was, Lillian was known for being kind of morose, and sometimes her statements did um, border on what we would today call um, suicidal ideology, at least according to Thomas's attorneys. A lot of the testimony focused on the time that Thomas and Lillian were both um, visiting the Walker's house. And very little was said in court about Lillian's behavior and her association with other men. And like I said, she had a little bit of a tarnished reputation. Or I shouldn't say tarnished. She had a reputation. Okay. Um, but it seems like the attorneys and the press in Richmond had this unspoken agreement not to badmouth the dead woman, which is completely different than anything we see today. And maybe we should go back to that. I don't know. Anyway, the trial lasted for about a month, and in the end, the jury was left to decide whether or not the long list of circumstantial evidence was enough to prove Thomas guilty. The jury was instructed by the judge that, quote, proof of guilt by circumstantial evidence did not require, quote, an absolute demonstrative certainty, but only a, quote, moral certainty. So the judge is saying, look, we're not looking for 100% here. If the circumstantial evidence is saying, yeah, for sure, you know, we're not looking for 100% is what the judge was kind of advising the jury. So the jury took these instructions to heart because Thomas was convicted on the circumstantial evidence of a watch key, a torn note, and a handful of witnesses, witnesses who testified to seeing the couple together on the day of the murder. This was not the first time the couple had been seen um, staying together in a hotel in Richmond City. So Thomas was, in fact, found guilty of first-degree murder, and of course there was an appeal because it's a capital murder and death penalty was given. But in the end, the case was upheld by the Virginia Supreme Court. And like most public and divis divisive trials, the verdict did nothing to settle the matter in the minds of the citizens of Richmond. Doubt about Thomas's guilt remained, even though most people thought him guilty. 2,713 citizens from Virginia, um, nearly 300 of them from the city of Richmond, petitioned the governor for clemency. William Hatcher was Thomas's spiritual advisor, and he summed up the situation as this, quote, At one moment, I fear he is guilty and will die with a lie on his lips. The next, I think that he may be innocent, and I fear that it will be judicial murder, end quote. Police, clergymen, reporters all tried to convince Thomas to confess, but he maintained his innocence to the end. As his hanging approached, Thomas stated that he had been with another woman the night of the murder, but honor would not allow him to identify her, which would then force her to become public and to be shamed, and he would not do that to save his own life. So he still is looking like kind of a upstanding kind of dude, in spite of the fact that he was just found guilty of murdering his pregnant second cousin. Anyway, <laughs> the hanging of Thomas took place on January 14th of 1887. By Virginia law, it was to be private, but thousands of people surrounded the jail yard 
where the execution was scheduled to take place. The judge had allowed only 12 spectators, but more than 300 entered the jail yard. And instead of risking a riot, the police just let them stay. Thomas wrote a book entitled Clervius. Clervius. Okay, his last name is C-L-U-V-E-R-I-U-S. Clervius, My Life, Trial, and Conviction. This book was sold to the public at the execution for 50 cents per copy to help defray his legal expenses. To the disappointment of those who purchased his book, it was not a tell-all confession, but instead he continued to assert that Lillian had committed suicide. Now, some of the details of his execution show how, um, oh, let's use the word invested, people really were about being part of his death. It also shows that maybe some people still really were um, uncertain about his guilt. The rope used to hang Thomas was made of red and white silk. The intention was to cut it into pieces to be sold as souvenirs after the hanging. They also intended to sound as signal the moment the trap was sprung. <laughs> both of these ideas, both of these plans were stopped by special order from the Virginia governor. Now, um, Herbert Ezekiel witnessed the hanging and he wrote that the sheriff had oiled the rope with sweet oil rather than cold grease. The sweet oil caused the slipping of the noose. And in the end, it just complicated the actual execution. When the trap door was sprung at 1.09 p.m., the silk rope stretched until Thomas's feet were just inches from the ground. The loop itself extended nearly 18 inches above his head, and it took 10 minutes before Thomas was declared dead. Thomas was the last person to be hung as an execution in the state of Virginia, as a, a um, criminal execution. Okay, there were still lots of people hung in Virginia, but as far as a criminal execution, Thomas was the last one to be hung in Virginia. Thomas was buried in the Tunstall burying ground behind the house where he was arrested. And um, this is the same house that he lived in and that Lillian or Lillian lived in when they were going to school. Um, there is a piece of white marble that marks the grave of Lillian Madison in Richmond's Oakwood Cemetery. And the body of her unborn son was buried in the coffin with her. What makes this case so interesting is the doubt that still lingers, and it's been over 100 years. Heck, at this point, it's been 150 almost, right? Okay, I don't do math. Check the math and verify, but I don't do math. But I'm, I'm going, you know, close to 150. <laughs> um, there was a re reportedly some attempt by Thomas's supporters to um, claim that Lillian was a troubled woman. Um, the reports of her morose, suicidal comments, her reports of her um, claiming sadness and depression. They also claimed that she had more than one man friend, air quotes you can't see again. And there was the impression that it was entirely possible that Thomas was not even the father of her unborn child. So these are some things that were put out by Thomas's supporters that both the press and the lawyers never really drug into the trial. Um, we will never really know what happened to Lillian the night at the reservoir. 
Was it suicide? Was she murdered? Was Thomas a vile seducer of women? Or was he merely another victim? Keep in mind that um, he's got a girl, a fiance. He's like engaged to another woman, but he was more than one time seen spending the night in a hotel with Lillian, the same hotel that Lillian was in. Just throwing that out there. So, yeah, I'm just putting that out there. Thomas would reportedly claim in his book to the very end that, quote, I did not see F.L. Madison during the day and the night of the 13th of March. That is all the confession I have to make. Okay, I have a couple minutes to chat about this because this coloring is all in real time. I didn't speed it up because I wasn't sure exactly how long the story was going to take. But I have questions. My first question is, what was the deal with Lillianne's parents and her mom's family? Like, was it really just that they were poor and her mom's extended family was rich? Was it really just pride and we cannot accept help from you to help get our daughter in a better place? Or was there something else? Couldn't find it. Um, only found the reference that there was um, a less, less than perfect copacetic relationship. Okay. My next thought was, how old was Lillianne when she was thrown a fit about wanting to go to school and being mad at her parents about not being able to go? Like, was this tween age temper tantrum or was this, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old, I need to make something better of myself. Why won't you, you help me do this? Don't know. Um, don't know. But also in the 1880s, children were, children grew up faster. You know, you know, 10 year olds were considered fully capable of helping run an entire farm. So totally different. Um, my next question, at what point in time, or my next thought, I don't know if it's a question, but whatever. At what point in time did Thomas and Lillian, when they were both staying at their uncle's house, decide, hey, yeah, let's hook up. <laughs> I know I shouldn't wonder about that, but dude, they're, they're related. And they knew they were related. They were both um, put through school by the same aunt, Aunt Jane. So they knew they were related. He was a couple years older than her. So he was probably um, doing his college in Richmond the same time she was attending school while she was living with her Aunt Jane. Um, but wow, that's just a weird one. And people commented on how much they really liked each other and nobody thought, who we need to maybe not encourage this. Okay, they're second cousins which in the 1880s was not horribly unheard of, I suppose. But we're not talking royalty or rich socialite families here. We're talking about farmers' children. So I don't know. I think that's kind of a weird one. Although I will say that when I was like 10, there was a girl my age that liked one of my cousins, and I told her she was not ever allowed to date him because she just was not good enough for him. <laughs> you know, when you're 10, you say dumb things. Um, how do you feel about this story? Like, do you feel like the circumstantial evidence was enough to prove that Thomas had actually been the, the, the reason that Lillian, Lillian died? I don't know. You tell me. I feel like if they'd had a little bit of forensics, it would have been a done deal. But I found photos. Yep, I found them. This is Fanny Lillian, Lillian, I keep saying Lillian, Lillian Madison. It's an old photo. It's a nice photo. This is a picture of her grave marker in the Richmond Cemetery. Also found a photograph of Thomas. Thomas's middle name was Judge, I think. Can't remember. Handsome dude. Nice looking chap, right? But also, also, found a picture of the, the watch key that was found on the fence hole. The evidence, the evidence envelope. How cool is that? Also, 
the note he supposedly left at the hotel for Lillian. Torn up and taped and put back together. And picture of the copy of his book. You know, where he said, I really didn't do it. And people were ticked off that they spent 50 cents on it. And last but not least, least <laughs> the fence around Thomas's burial plot. Such an interesting story. Um, way too many unanswered questions, but that's what you get with murders before forensics. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I have a couple other videos here I think you might like. I've also added the subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, please do so. I would love it. Leave me a comment below. Tell me how you feel. Give me a thumbs up and have a really great day.